Welcome to Chris Parking Shooting Sports. I've been using this PARD 007S for the last few weeks now. It's mounted on a Nightforce NX8 2.5 to 20 by 50. This is the F1 first focal plane scope. So you can read all the statistics, all the things about sensors and image size and screen size and everything like that online. It's all in the instructions on the Sportsman Gun Center website. Here are my findings. Okay, number one, the critical big difference between the 007S and the 007A is the mounting system and the physical length of the unit. Which I put one down there. This is the 007A. So if I show you this on the ceiling camera here, you can see the physical difference in length between the two which when it's actually applied to a gun gives about 15 millimeters difference in terms of the physical space for your head to fit here where the eye relief used to be and of course that's now filled by the unit. Now when I put that on there, if I hold that sort of side by side with that, um, it's, it's quite hard to sort of picture exactly but essentially that is the difference in, in length between one and the other to physically fit your head behind that. Now, that looks quite comfortable, doesn't it? And do you know what? It is. Those 50 millimeters are quite critical. So let's just put that down for now. The main way that's been done is it's moved the battery from being installed lengthways, longitudinally, down the actual tube itself. It's now stored vertically in here. Other than that, functionality, sensor size, all that kind of thing, it isn't fundamentally different. It still uses the same 18650 flat top batteries. They pop in on the top here. And they go in vertically like that. Um, you still got an illuminator on the front, same as be before here. I think that's useful to about mm, 50 meters maximum, so great for sort of smaller rimfires, definitely air rifle range. Uh, and it is of course focusable, so you can you know tighten that beam in to um, to avoid too much you know reflection coming back from intervening foliage or or farmyard equipment, fences, bales, whatever, things like that. So that is handy. Now you'll see on top here, I have actually got a quite large um, PBIRL illuminator. Now that is what I've been predominantly using, and you'll see a lot of footage I've taken over the last few evenings while I've been out with this. Shows the difference between the standard illuminator and the PBIR. It's significant. That adds probably 250 meters range to the capability of the unit. Now. It's all very well, you know, accommodating, waiting for the perfect night to give you the greatest footage. This has been in use by me for real world pest control, foxing, etc. So, although the video images might not be as perfect as you'd have hoped for, well, they are real world. And the thing is, I've got view of a fox I was tracking in from 350 metres in an unshootable position, circled the whole way around us, was encountered again at about 50 metres, moved out to about 80 metres where I then shot it. That's all on film and you'll see that. So it gives you an idea of the difference between fantastical footage that you think is the best thing since sliced bread and real world footage of what you can create. But the point is, if I take that off as easily as that, that's my normal daylight scope. Put it on and it's my normal nighttime scope. But it is of course usable in daylight too and there's some footage taken videoing with it on daylight targets. One thing I really like, and we'll see this on the ceiling cam here, is because it's a rear add-on, it has no effect whatsoever on zero. You see people say, oh, it wobbles a little bit. It doesn't matter. It's your eye looking at a television which is feeding from a video camera that's looking at a reticle. So essentially, the mechanical movement between the scope and the rifle is what affects zero, not what's looking at it. Now, being first focal plane, this scope is great because first focal plane non-illuminated isn't so good because the reticle of course changes a lot in size and magnification. Magnification becomes quite critical as to what you want to use in night vision, but you don't lose the reticle on this night force because you can just ping the illumination on and you see it easily. Secondary to that, it's quite a compact scope, so it doesn't make the rifle overtly bulky. You do see a little bit that the illuminator is bringing the, the beam of light down from the right slightly, but to be honest, that's only when you're looking for it and you don't notice it when you're actually shooting. The thing I like so much about being able to use a rear add-on is the fact I've still got all my mechanical adjustments on the scope. So if I want to take a longer range shot or to change zero slightly, I've got my turrets adjusting absolutely as normal here. 
that's fantastic. And if you find yourself a couple of clicks out from zero because you know you've cleaned the rifle or it's had a bit of a bump or something like that, it's literally a second's job to change it. Just click that turret. And it's the same with windage. Um, okay, I've got the added illuminator on, which adds a bit of bulk here, but I've still got my click values there on the windage, which I've just clicked and forgotten how much I clicked it by. I'll have to reset that in a little while when I've gone back to zero and looked at it. Now, the other thing that's very interesting is that PARD used to supply raw black insulation tape to make up the difference exactly between the ocular body of the scope and the actual rear fitting of it. Now, that worked really well to be honest, but a lot of pe people thought it was a bit Heath Robinson. But now they supply a series of plastic collars, polymer collars, which will make up that difference. So this, these are marked one, two, and three. Uh, I think I've got number one on, which is the thinnest one. Two's a little bit thicker, three's a little bit thicker than that. So it makes up for the size of the ocular body versus the actual clamp on mount here. Once the correct shims are in place, you've got a smooth sliding fit. You can just set this up so that you've two screws there, you nip those up with the supplied Allen key and that will clamp it on the body. Once that's done, nothing moves. On this Nightfall scope, because the whole actual ocular body moves to set fast focus and you've got a lock ring on it here, it does make sense to make sure, specifically on this scope, that that's locked down very, very hard. You will see in some of the footage, there's a slight misalignment from vertical, but of course when you're shooting, you do not notice that. You only notice it sometimes a little bit if it's actually after the fact and you see it on the screen because it doesn't look quite square, the reticle looks quite off level. But when it's of course on here, it doesn't matter if the unit's that way, that way, that way or, or, or any way up. You see through to the scope and of course as long as you've mounted your scope correctly originally, there's no issue at all. Chargers with a USB cable. That's very, very simple. You can take them out and put them into another charger if you like, like any 18650 battery, but it charges as it should do. And on the bottom here, you'll see we've got the slot for the USB charger and also the micro SD port for the micro SD card, sorry. That's got a tripod mount there, standard quarter inch threads. So you can put it on any kind of camera accessory if you want to use that. And to be fair, it really works well as a night vision spotter, especially at close range where you've got your focus dial on the side here and you can focus it beautifully, even with just that little spotter on there. It's great for walking around the farm at night and just seeing what's going on, even if you don't want to be carrying a whole load of kit, because that is literally just hand-sized. What else can I tell you about it? Well, you'll see a lot from the footage. Um, as I say, it's real-world footage. I'm not one to create artificially good pictures. I'm more interested in doing my normal shooting routine and deciding whether something is or isn't capable of what I need it to be and at what cost. So, so statistics aside, the big deal for me is yes, I do like the 007S more than the A or the V purely because for more money, but it does save that physical size. And this one is also IP67 rated for waterproof, which, you know, I don't want to get it soaked, but it's always raining. And, you know, sadly recently, although it's been quite, quite temperate in the air quality, it's been very damp, which affects image quality. And of course, damp creates mist, condensation, all those kind of things you're not having any kind of problem with this. And of course, if you ever do get anything like that, it's so simple just to unclip it, let it have a few minutes of air temperature and back on it goes. And as I said, you know, that is now night vision scope mode. If I want full daylight scope, well, it's absolutely back to normal there like that. So I really can't complain. I've used the 007A, I've used the 007S, I've just had some 007Vs delivered actually. And I've also used the PAR 00A LRF, which is the standalone unit. It doesn't fit on the back, that's a complete integral night vision daylight optic. I don't like having to change a lot of things and zeroing electronic scopes can be a little bit arduous. Doing it in the normal way, the daylight optic mechanical clicks, gives you all the normal capabilities of the scope, plus that. And now it's that little bit shorter, that makes all the difference for ergonomic comfort when shooting. Having a rifle of known zero before you even add night vision capability is an incredible confidence booster, but this goes to show just how precisely you can aim and still shoot in daylight with full video recording options.
This gives you a great chance to play with all the functions and get to know the button controls for things like video recording. You can also play about with focal settings so that makes sure that by the time you go out in darkness, where things are a little bit less familiar, everything's ingrained within your muscle memory. So, like any new item, you do have to get used to all the button controls and presses and things. So essentially, just to run you through them briefly, the eyepiece focuses on the back, which focuses you on the screen internal. And this one on the side here focuses the reticle inside and the image quality, which does work in cooperation with the parallax control of the scope. A parallax control scope is pretty much mandatory. Whereas the 007A used to be available in 12 and 16 millimeter formats, and the newer V is also, this has just one format. And I have to say, is slightly more, um, it's easier to set up, it's not as critical on the exact position of the image coming out the back of the scope. It's a very complicated optical solution which is made easier by actually trying it and seeing it yourself. But essentially, you don't really make a mistake with one of these if you buy the 12 or the 16, which do have slight preferences either way depending on eye relief. I would always say, pick a scope with generally longer eye relief because it's going to be set further away from you anyway, and when you add one of these rear add-ons, of course, that's taking up some of that space, and if it's further forward anyway, say 100 millimeters compared to 85 millimeters, you're stealing less from the physical space required for yourself. Other controls than that, you've seen the SD card, the slots on the bottom for the USB-C cable for charging. There's also an out port, which I'm not going to be using. It does, of course, video. You can take stills and video footage. I've used quite a lot of footage. And of course, it has daylight and darkness options, as well as an onboard illuminator with three power settings. I'll show you through those, but I think for foxing use, you are going to be using a bigger illuminator. That's fine for air rifle use, though, because it does have a Picatinny on top if you want to put the illuminator on top. It does make the scope quite high up, and of course, it's quite close back to you. I prefer just to put it there on the scope body myself, but, you know, horses for courses, each to their own. Power button's on top, it's got fast power off, and you've got a selection of buttons here which control recording, the menu structures, uh, intensity, brightness, the IR power, and the magnification control as well, because you can also step up through digital magnification, as well as using that which is available from the scope itself. Personally, I didn't really use the digital magnification much, because I preferred the optical magnification on the scope, which also gave me control over the reticle as well. And I found it easier it's just to set up on two and a half, leave that on its bottom and magnification, and then just use this mechanically because it's so quick. And of course, in the dark at night, when you've got gloves on, using smaller buttons, you tend to concentrate on the ones you really need, and it's easier to use mechanical controls in comparison to electronic buttons, which is not to say they don't work just fine, but in the dark, I found it easier to concentrate on mechanical controls rather than electronic buttons, but that's up to you as to what you want to do. Here you can see I'm playing around with the magnification setting on the night force scope, which also affects the reticle size on this first focal plane optic. But of course, even with the small reticle that's illuminated, I can still clearly see it in the picture. I'm on my own test range here tonight where I do some foxing, but I've also got all my gong set out. So I've got great capability of reviewing targets at different distances and knowing exactly what I'm looking at and getting really used to what I'm using in the dark before I actually attempt to take on any live quarry. Here I'm experimenting a bit more with reticle intensity, but look how much information is available from the reticle itself in terms of seeing all the hash marks and aim off in the milliradian first focal plane setup. This is my usual target board. I normally shoot at 100 metres, but it happens to be 125 metres away from my position tonight. This gives you an idea of the resolution capability in complete darkness. Until you've really learned a night vision optic, it's great to experiment with the illumination control, both in terms of the beam size and the strength required. As you can see, I'm experimenting here with the PBIRL externally. 
This 300mm steel gong is 175 metres away from my vantage point. This is my steel muntjac target at about 200 metres. Here you can see the transition from the onboard illuminator at about 40 metres on the fence post and then when you turn the larger external illuminator on and how it extends the range capability of the pard. Here you can see me closing down the focal size of the illuminator just to try and pick out these eyes over the brow of the hill without giving me too much intermediate reflection which tends to make any night vision unit dim down its settings. This hare is chasing around about 200 metres away from my position. As said before, this fox was first picked up in the thermal at about 350 metres out, but it's in an unshootable position. I was tracking it through the pard and calling it gently. Eventually, it circled all the way around us to pick up our scent in the wind, but couldn't do so, and eventually I picked it right up at about 50 metres away. It then transferred across us to about 90 metres away, then back in again to 80 metres with a few more squeaks and a shout, and I shot it cleanly. The speed of fast mechanical magnification control is appreciable here. The 007S has a different new and improved mounting system to the A and Z models. Magnification is 4 to 14 times and eye relief is 45 millimeters. No problem with recoil on a 243 rifle. Eyepiece resolution is 1024 by 768 pixels. There are three intensity settings for the onboard illuminator, the maximum power of which is 5 watts and suitable out to about 50 meters on air rifle or rim fire in my opinion. The IP67 waterproof rating allows for submerging up to 1 metre for 30 minutes. The 007S is available in 850nm or 940nm setups, but this is the 850nm, which is a slightly visible but slightly stronger infrared setup. Video recording can be either recoil or manually activated. Battery life is suggested to be 8 hours and I had no problem in 4-6 to six hour foxing sessions. I wasn't using the Wi-Fi capability, but it does have one. 
Overall height is 118 millimeters, overall width is 75 millimeters, and overall length is 102 millimeters, with a 265 gram overall weight, which in fairness seems to add virtually nothing to most sporting rifles. Things like illuminators and bipods and moderators add far more bulk. So, my general overall opinion of the PAR 007S is it is an improved unit over the A. The V has just arrived, I think I'm still going to prefer the S, but of course it is more expensive and the V is the same physical dimensions as the A. I have to get all my letters correct here now, don't I? In terms of fogging, misting, things like that, you've got bellows on the eye cup and you, you don't have to keep your face glued to it because of course it's the heat from your eyes and your skin that causes condensation when it builds up, especially on a colder surface. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this little review of my thoughts on the PAD 007S. Um, I'm going to keep using it because I've got the rest of the winter for foxing and I really like using it and I like the fact I can use one of my favourite rifles and it doesn't affect it at all. I might actually try um, using the pad on a slightly lower cost optic because the high end optics do tend to filter a lot of the infrared that of course the nighttime sensor in here feeds from. This is £535 with a £2,000 scope, that's quite an expensive package, whereas if you drop that to maybe a £500 scope, we're looking at just over £1,000 for a night vision capable package. And of course the ultimate low light doesn't matter as much then because you'll be using these. These are fantastic in what I call the witching hour, between, you know, just as dusk goes through and when a daylight optic really, really struggles. But a night vision optic, especially in colour mode, isn't quite as, as great as being able to see in daylight in full colour. Now, whereas these, because of the superb sensitivity of the sensors and full colour mode, are absolutely fantastic when it comes to that sort of late dusk hunting element. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed that little review. Thank you for watching. Please like, please subscribe, please comment, because your comments are what drive the videos. Um, look after yourselves. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.